There are a few things in cannabis as frustrating as mold. It's true. All of your hard work can come crashing down by the sudden visual signs of powdery mildew or botrytis molds. It's enough to make you cry, chastise the source of your clones, and try to strike a bargain with God. There's so much misinformation out there about both powdery mildew and botrytis that's been handed down from generation to generation of cannabis growers. Now, though, cannabis is attracting scientists and laboratories that can help sort out the biology of these moldy menaces to society. If you enjoy hearing frank discussions that dive deep into cannabis health, business, and technique, I encourage you to subscribe to our newsletter. Every week, you'll receive a new podcast episode delivered right to your inbox along with commentary on a couple of the most important news items from the week and videos, too. Recent videos have included Kevin Jodry of Wonderland Nursery talking about breeding cannabis for the best terpene profiles, and my keynote address at the Imperius Expo in Phoenix about why we choose cannabis business even though the risks are so high. Don't rely on social media to let you know when a new podcast is published. Sign up for the updates to make sure you don't miss an episode. You are listening to Shaping Fire, and I'm your host, Shango Los. My guest today is Kevin McKiernan. Kevin McKiernan is founder and chief science officer of Medicinal Genomics. Medicinal Genomics made worldwide news in 2011 when it publicly released the first genome sequence for cannabis sativa. As a result of this work, Medicinal Genomics launched a suite of tools for the detection of microbial contamination of cannabis. Prior to Medicinal Genomics, Kevin was the team leader of R&D for the Human Genome Project at the Whitehead Institute for Biomedical Research at MIT. One piece of vocabulary I want to point out for this week's episode, we use the term labs a lot this week. Sometimes we're referring to cannabis analytical laboratories, but most of the time we're using the word labs as shorthand for a collection of living probiotic bacteria, originally referring only to lactic acid bacteria in organic growing. It's often used nowadays to refer to a wide range of probiotic cultured microorganisms. Welcome to the show, Kevin. Thank you for having me, Shango. This is uh, quite an exceptional podcast. I'm honored to be here. <laughs> right on. Thank you very much. So, Kevin, you know, this time of year, molds and mildews are being talked about by growers everywhere because as the, as the nights are getting colder and damp fog and rain start to become more common in the, in the weather report, mold becomes more of a threat. And, you know, we'll talk about botrytis a bit later in the show, but easily the most common scourge that everyone has to deal with is powdery mildew. Biologically, what is powdery mildew? Okay, so this is um, this evaded us for quite a bit. Um, I think the best resources to go to are um, a book from John McPartland and uh, Dave Watson and, and Robert Clark. It has a great list of all these hemp diseases. Um, we, we, we marched through there trying to build um, DNA assays that could detect powdery mildew. Uh, and, and, you know, why would anyone want to try and pick up this organism? Well, there, from what we've learned about what powdery mildew does in hops, which is the closest uh, relative to cannabis, is it has an infection cycle uh, where when it first lands on the plant it actually builds what's known as a hostoria or like a tap root into the plant where the spore lands and then it builds a mycelium network and um, this mycelium network is sometimes it's it's debatable whether it's in the plant or outside of the plant but it spreads it spreads that network across the plant and it takes uh, in hops sometimes 18 to maybe 40 days before it gets a stress event that makes it make spores which is the powder that you see and those spores are very hardy, and they spread the they spread the disease. Um, so we got brought in to try to figure out what this thing was by trying to um, build assays for it. And we build um, we built some of these DNA assays going after the organisms that John was pointing us to, which was L. torica. And they have an organism in there called S. macularis, but it's recently been renamed to P. macularis, which stands for, I think, Podosphera macularis. Um, so what are these things, uh, is your question. These are obligate biotrophs, which means that you can't culture them unless you have leaves. We tried that. We tried putting them in cultures, and that didn't behave. You have to find a grind up leaves or somehow and, and make it so that there's actually uh, some leaf cells in there for these things to culture. But an obligate biotroph also means that they're generally very much adapted to their host. Um, so you, you tend not to see powdery mildews hopping species to species very much like you might see with botrytis. Um, and so you'll find powdery mildews that are very specialized. So like the ones that are in grapes are known as golovinomyces. There's a vino in there. Um, the ones that are on hops is P. macularis. And uh, we had some debate as to whether that was crossing over into cannabis. And it may be. We've not yet found evidence for that yet. Uh, when we dug into this, we built all of these assays um, hoping we'd find something that was on grapes like Golovinomyces or 
these um, El Torica is another one that's mentioned in the literature. None of them worked. And so we went down a bit of a rabbit hole trying to sequence the genome of this thing. Uh, and what we have found to date is we actually believe it's a novel species that's on cannabis. Uh, and um, it is something that has about 98% identical to P. macularis, which is on hops, and uh, about 98% identical as well to Golovinomyces ambrosia, which is another um, powdery mildew that's out there. Um, so uh, they're very interesting organisms, but they can, as everyone knows, they can totally destroy your crop. However, you can detect them in advance of the sporulation stage, where they make these things known as canidia. Um, and that's what we're aiming to do with this genetic test, is to enable people to screen clones or to screen their plants at a certain period of time and remove anything that has a positive hit. Um, and maybe this will help people breed faster for resistance. Uh, if you're screening for plants that uh, have a lot of this on them, well, they're probably susceptible to it um, uh, unless you're picking up a single spore. And so we've been trying to do some work where this test is fairly sensitive enough to pick up these mycelium networks but doesn't get triggered by the spores. Um, and that's not as hard to do as you might imagine. The spores can last a winter. They're really hardy and they're very hard to break. Um, so uh, long story is uh, there are different species pretty much in every organism you run into and we don't see much evidence of this hopping species to species or host to host I should say. This is the first time I've heard the the anchor on the spore described. Um, that's probably one of the ways that people get confused about whether or not uh, PM is systemic to the plant or merely opportunist, because I can imagine that the the spore lands and and it creates that anchor, which which is 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 probably breaking the. I guess the derma of the plant, um, right, right. and and so suddenly now it's also inside. So so w with that anchor idea, what do you what is it biologically? Is it systemic or is it opportunist and topical? So that's a good point. The definition of systemic is usually reserved for something that might be circulating through the, through the xylem and phloem or like in the bloodstream of like HIV in in humans. And I'd say it might be hard to claim that. It's systemic, um, although we, I should say the experiments we have done have not necessarily nailed that. What we have seen is that it can be present in the plant in a mycelium network where you can't visibly see it. Um, and the debate right now is whether that mycelium network is internal to the leaf or external to the leaf. But um, for practical purposes, it may not matter. It may be a bit of an academic question. Um, for screening purposes, uh, there's not much use in a genetic test that picks up powdery mildew after you can see it. It's too late then. Um, you really want to get something that picks it up early, and that's the key to, to, to thwarting most infectious disease cycles is to actually have early detection so that you can remove the plants that carry the infection from, the, from spreading it any further, a kind of a quarantine and contain uh, approach. Um, ultimately, breeding for resistance I think is the right thing to do, but um, this may be a tool that helps accelerate that. If you can find the plants that can chronically have have high levels of, of powdery mildew DNA on them. Well, then you those are most likely to be susceptible strains, and you should pull them pull them out of, out of the works. There's a really good paper um, I'll point people to that maybe we can put into the show notes from a gentleman by the name of Weeblin, who did a lot of work to try and address this systemic um, issue. And in that paper, they do mention systemic, but I think it might be a misuse of uh, of, of the term. But what they demonstrate is that uh, this they stain this the DNA of this organism uh, with, and you can see the network of this mycelium. It's really kind of beautiful to look at. Um, and you can see that from a single um, spore that hits the leaf, it really goes, it goes millimeters away, out, really outside of the entire focal view of the, of the images that they're taking. So these networks spread very, very quickly um, around the plant. And, and um, I think the unknown questions we have today are, well, how early can you actually pick this up? And how quickly does that mycelium network spread? And are you going to get it 18 days before it, it outbreaks? Are you going to get it, you know, 40 days? These are unknowns in cannabis right now. We, we've seen the work in hops, and we're kind of drawing parallels from hops. But a lot of the work in hops shows that P. macularis will have maybe 20 to 40 DPI, which is days post-infection when, when you tend, tend to see um, the actual spores kick off from when they found the initial um, 
infection of a spore. So that's a, that's a big gap, and, and stress tends to um, uh, accelerate this. So if you happen to get infected just before flowering or before flush, um, it, that's going to bring out uh, some of the, uh, the sporulation events. It's, it, it, I can't help but chuckle when you tell me that the science is not fully decided on whether or not it's systemic or merely topically opportunistic, because there's so much arguing and gnashing of teeth online between growers who know for sure one side or the other and everybody's getting upset about it. And you're saying, well, actually the science is still out and we're still trying to figure that out. You know, what, what's it doing to the plant itself? I mean, we know that when um, the, the plant is um, uh, more stressed, it's more susceptible. And then when the, uh, the spore feels has a stress event, it spreads. Um, but, but what is it actually doing to the plant itself that is uh, damaging the plant? Well, there's. Um, I, I think the stress signals that go throughout the plant probably trigger a tremendous amount of um, secondary messenger signaling. I think there have there has been evidence that when you get these types of priming responses with, let's say, another fungal infection I've read about is botrytis, um, you can see that there's sometimes uh, terpene expression that changes. Um, there is a host of other secondary messages that, that come out of the plant's immune system that, that begin to respond to infection like this. Um, and unfortunately, to further complicate the matter, you'll find a lot of literature out there that show co-infections of Botrytis and PM or uh, Fusarium and Botrytis. Or, uh, so it seems if once the immune system's down, uh, it, it, you know, everybody it, piles it, on. Everyone piles on, um, yeah. and that actually was a, a really complicating factor for us in trying to sequence this genome because um, so many times we were trying to scrape these spores off. You can almost do it with a glass slide and get all types of powder on top of the slide, and we try to lyse those spores and sequence the genome, and we always get something else. We always get like penicillium or all these other co-infections, and it's just because they happen to lyse more readily than the spores, and they're coming along for the ride. Um, it, it took us a long time of figuring out how to wash those spores off, and then and then to really you have to really treat them with phenol to actually crack them open to get the DNA uh, and to sequence it. Um, and then when you finally do have that genome, it's never a perfectly pure genome of just uh, powdery mildew spores. There's still some other contaminants there. And to make matters worse, these genomes tend to be about 100 to 180 million bases in size, but they're 90% transposable elements, meaning they're, it's repetitive as all hell. And it's really hard to put the genome back together um, once you do finally get the DNA. So, um, yeah, it's been a bit of a frustrating rabbit hole, to be honest with you, but we only really needed one really unique stretch of DNA in the genome that we could anchor a PCR target for um, to, to, to pick this up. And fortunately, um, we don't have to ask people to go and do this magical spore prep that we we're talking about to pick up the mycelium network. The mycelium network is really easy to crack and easy to lice. And we just do that with a single um, core, like a hole punch of a leaf. And a four millimeter hole punch of a leaf, uh, we usually put two of those into each boil and we just boil that, that DNA and it pops open the mycelium network and we get enough DNA to then pick it up with one of our color metric assays. It's, this is a a PCR assay that changes color on you so that you don't need a detector for it and you can run it in the field. Uh, oh, it's kind wow. of like, that right, makes uh, it a really idiot proof. Yeah. Yeah. That's, that's the intent. But you know, at the same time, it's, it's kind of a, a, a like a pregnancy test is it's plus minus. It's not very quantitative at the moment. So, you know, when, when it changes color on you, um, we still don't have a good correlation with that color change to how intensely infected the plant is. Um, what people won't really want is like, well, give me an estimate of the colony forming units you might get as a comparison with this amount of DNA. And we just don't have those cause we can't culture this thing. Yeah. Right on. Uh, so um, we're just uh, we're we're thinking about making even making a quantitative version of it just for more research purposes. But right now it's just dialed in to be um, as sensitive as we can get it with this colorimetric assay. So it will it will get triggered by a single cell. Um, that much we we know because we've targeted this at a part of the genome as a really high copy number. Um, there's about 50 copies of this region of the genome. So a single spore or a single cell will give us 50 targets to to amplify from, and uh, that seems to give it. Um, you know, quite about quite amount of sensitivity. Right on. Let's jump back to when you were talking about how it spreads. So you described this this stress event, and I, um, I'm sure that there are growers. I mean, they know what causes their plants to stress, but are those always going to be the same things that causes the the spore? 
to stress? What specifically can make up the stress event that will cause the powdery mildew spores to pop and spread throughout the garden? Because whatever those stresses are, as a grower, we'd want to reduce those to as low as possible. Uh, I mean, the things that I've heard about, I, I don't have as much experience growing as, as many of people in your audience, but what I've, what I've been reading about through my bookworming efforts here on this on this genome is that it's usually a humidity effect or a temperature effect that stresses it. Um, but I've also been very fascinated in in the microbiome in the plant. Um, so there's there's a lot of evidence that trichoderma and other and other uh, bacillus species can knock this thing out. And I wouldn't be surprised if uh, if your root microbiome isn't healthy that you're going to have a, a nutrient deficiency of some sort that may not be completely evident by a leaf color change, but it may they may be deficient nonetheless and that that can also trigger stress. So um, some of the best biocontrols that are mentioned in the literature are, in fact, using trichoderma, which is another fungus, but it happens to make uh, like chitinases and other enzymes that go and destroy this thing. Uh, and those, those are probably what are being emulated in a lot of these products that are on the shelves that are, that are not pesticidal-based but are more enzyme and, and biocontrol agents that you see. Sure, sure. Um, and, and as a matter of fact, you know, uh, it, people who are into living soils and probiotics and, and producing their own labs and, and using milk instead of chemicals, I mean, this really does seem the direction that everybody's going because a lot of the traditional, you know, anti-molds, anti-fungals that people have used on plants in, in the past, no one wants to touch that stuff anymore because it's, it's going to ding them at a pesticide uh, uh, test at the state level and suddenly they're going to lose their crop. So people seem to be more and more moving to work um, in tune with nature um, to to rebalance their 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 leaf or to just straight out knock out the mold spores uh, that way. Yeah, and I think it's that's it's it's very key right now with all the extraction we have going on. We've seen all these wonderful papers from many of the people who've been on your cast before, um, whether it be Jeff Raber or or uh, Ethan Russo that. These pesticides tend to hyper enrich in extraction. I mean, we, we may get a couple, three or four fold increase in the cannabinoids, but they're seeing a hundred to a thousand fold enrichments for some of these uh, pesticides. So, you know, if people are using mycobutanol to fight this, we really, really should change practices. The, the one challenge in changing those practices is that if you do move to some probiotics, you have to be very careful of what microbial tests people are running uh, because a lot of those probiotics are going to trigger your total aerobic counts or your total yeast and mold counts are going to are going to go up. Uh, and, and we really need to work with the regulators to not penalize people for these organic practices because, uh, you know, trichoderma and bacillus shouldn't be a human threat. They shouldn't be something that elevates your petri film counts. Um, so we, we do a lot of work on that side of the fence as well. We make, we make um, quantitative PCR assays for um, microbial testing that a lot of the labs use in Many of the states, and they tend to be dialed in to, and, and fairly specific. In fact, our total yeast and mold test we have specifically does not hit PM and botrytis, and, and, uh, and if it did, it would probably fail. You know, thirty percent of the samples out there. Um, that test we've we've made sure the primers don't hit those because they're not human pathogens. Uh, they're, they're just plant pathogens and we can have separate tests to pick them up. You probably want to pick those up at a different time. You're, you're not interested in whether you have botrytis or powdery mildew after you've harvested. It's too late then. You want to know about that, you know, maybe six weeks to eight weeks earlier. And so, uh, we've consciously broken apart those tests so that they, they have different sensitivities and they can be used at different times. Right on. Well, we've got a lot more to talk about powdery mildew, but it's time to take our first short break and read right back. You are listening to Shaping Fire, and my guest today is Kevin McKernan, Chief Science Officer at Medicinal Genomics. As a listener of Shaping Fire, you already understand the importance of living soil when growing cannabis. When you have active microbe communities in your substrate, you go way beyond simply fertilizing with nitrogen, phosphorus, and potassium. Having active microorganisms in your substrate supports vigorous plant growth throughout the plant's root zone, making for higher yields and thriving flowers. Mammoth pea is the first organically derived microbial inoculant that focuses on your plant's nutrient cycling processes to release soil phosphorus and other micronutrients from their bound forms, making them more available to the plant. Increased levels of phosphorus will also keep inner nodes shorter and focus your plant's energy on bud production. Not only that, but the microbes act as a defense shield for the plant's rhizosphere by outcompeting potentially harmful pathogenic microbes. Pretty cool, right? Mammoth pea not only unlocks the nutrients in your soil, but it also helps protect your plant from disease. 
Mammoth peas' beneficial bacteria act like microbioreactors, continually producing enzymes that release nutrients. Mammoth pea was developed at a U.S. university and has been extensively tested by Colorado growers and independent laboratories. Mammoth pea is proven to increase growth and enhance blooming. One of the great things about supplementing with microorganisms is that they won't compete with whatever fertilizer program you're already running. Simply dose on top of your fertilizer schedule for increased benefits. To learn more and to find out where you can buy Mammoth Pea near you, check out their website at www.mammothmicrobes.com. Partner with microorganisms to create beautiful, thriving cannabis, Mammoth Pea. As cannabis normalization sweeps the country, knowledge of how to grow cannabis naturally and without synthetic inputs has become more and more available. In fact, probiotic growers are experiencing large yields and exceptional terpene profiles without using chemicals banned in their state. Move away from the risks inherent to chemical nutrients and instead invest in your soil. Use your soil again and again, reducing costs and improving the vitality of your soil with each cycle. Keep It Simple Organics has been a leader in aerated compost teas for years and now provide premium soils and nutrients to the cannabis industry. They offer a full line of all natural inputs for building your soil, feeding microbe communities, and brewing nutrient and compost teas. They can even help you test your soil to spot deficiencies that may be holding you back. Check out their website at kisorganics.com. Enter the word Shango into the form at checkout to receive 10% off your first order. Stop pouring bottled nutrients on your soil only to throw it out each cycle. Start building living soil that will serve you for years to come. Visit KISorganics.com and grow healthy, thriving cannabis. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shango Lose. And our guest this week is Kevin McKernan, Chief Science Officer at Medicinal Genomics. So during the first set, we were talking a lot about powdery mildew, and we were talking about, you know, some of the rumors about how it is spread versus the truth and the science of it. And I got to ask, you know, a lot of us have leaf hoppers, those little, those little bugs in our gardens. And, you know, technically, if we, we got inundated with leaf hoppers, they do suck out of the plant and they would be bad, but normally there's not enough to cause a problem. However, a lot of growers are suspicious of leaf hoppers because they think that they are moving the spores from leaf to leaf and then plant to plant and therefore acting as an agent for powdery mildew to spread. Do you buy that? So I have read that russet mites may do something similar. So I, if I had to place an educated guess, I'd say yes. Uh, that they could be spreading these things around, uh, and that could be one mechanism for uh, for moving more than just powdery mildew. It could, it, there could be a host of other diseases. I, I wouldn't be surprised if botrytis could move around that way as well. Mm, yeah, I, I hear that. All right, so then how about the other uh, – uh, uh, gosh, I don't <laughs> – I went to say old wives tales, but, but I don't, that doesn't make any sense. Cause I know a lot of old wives and all they say is brilliant stuff. So let's say <laughs> I've got another myth and, and, and a, a lot of people remove it with their fingers. Right. And they're like, Oh, I went through the whole plant and I rubbed it with my fingers and now I don't see any. And I've always thought that, yeah, you're removing the white, but you've just, you've just spread it around so you can't see it anymore. So, so to what advantage does rubbing it off with your fingers help at all? Yeah, I, I'll give you an anecdote around this. I, I don't think that would completely purify it from the plant just because these mycelium networks get built in a, and, and spread pretty quickly and you can't see them. So I imagine that would stay around. And that's actually – you have to almost um, imagine that network is like being an aspen stand where all the roots are connected and they you can sprout genetically similar things out of the root zone. That's, that's kind of what these mycelium networks are is they're creating this fabric from which it can grow spores at a later stress event. So I'd be that why that that might remove a lot of the spores and it's probably a good practice just to lower the spore count in, inside the garden and definitely clean your hands and don't touch any other plants after you do that but right. <laughs> uh, I wouldn't be surprised if it could if it could pop back out at a later stressor event when you do that I would probably be more inclined that maybe these sulfur treatments or these other milk based treatments which I'm assuming what the milk's doing is putting lactobacillus uh, in play Correct. but that probably does a better job um, uh, eating away that network. 
uh, and uh, and destroying it. So um, I, those are probably, I, I bet, more hardy mechanisms. Um, so one story, um, to give some folks a sense of the sensitivity here, there was one um, group here that was done. There's a, there's a company called Curated Leaf that runs our, um, our chemistry here in Massachusetts, and they went to one group. Grow. They tested 30 mothers. One of the mothers was positive for powdery mildew. They then in, then went and tested uh, what was it? 25 of the descendants, the clones off that mother, and two of those popped positive. Uh, so now they've pulled the mother and the and the two clones and then quarantined those. Um, but that gives you a sense of um, the sampling challenges we might find with this. That if it's if it's at a very low spore count or a very low frequency on the plant, it may not be all over the entire plant. It might just be in one side of the plant that happened to get a little bit damper based on the corner it was facing or something. Um, it managed to start colonizing the plant there, and when they cut clones from that, a couple of the clones ended up with the disease. So um, it, it does travel just in the cloning process alone. And that's one thing that I think people have to just keep an eye on. Right on. And similarly, and in reverse, when you mentioned that there, you know, there's a mother room and one of the of the 25 plants tested possible uh, positive for powdery mildew, I would think that chances are there's powdery mildew on all of the rest of the mothers as well. But the spore counts are so low that they just didn't come up on the tests. Yeah, it could it could have been that, or it could they could there could be more um, resistance as well. I mean, some of the resistance literature in Arapidopsis, which is a model organism, and that we're looking at in hops. There's six different um, genetic loci that have been identified in hops that are um, pointing towards their resistance mechanisms. And, and some of the resistance is that uh, we think that the, the, the stoma or, or, or stomata are, are smaller in some of the ones that are resistant, so it's harder for them to get that historia or that taproot into the plant. And other ones are just about enzymes that the, that the plant happens to make that, that might fight off this infection. So there's a, there's a host of different ways in which the plant – this is a hops plant, of course, but if you draw some of those parallels to cannabis, you have to imagine there, there may be more than one genetic resistance loci in the plant. Uh, and so some might actually get infected but never actually express the spores. Um, we don't know this yet. Yeah, they, um, may, they may just have it on the leaves, but it's not actually okay. affecting them because they either have, you know, uh, 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 some some magic chemical on the leaves or small yeah, stomata. Yeah. yeah, yeah, right. So we at the, what we're trying to do with the test is make sure that we we don't crack open too many spores. We want the spores to remain hardy and probably be missed by the test. We really want the test to be picking up the mycelium network, which we know is a sign of successful infection. Yeah, right. Uh, and so that's that's kind of what we've been aiming for. So changing gears a little bit, you know, we all want to avoid powdery mildew because it stresses out the plant, which eventually decreases yield and, and might take down the plant itself. And no one likes to harvest a plant and, and have it go poof with powdery mildew on the flowers afterwards because that just, that just the, that experience is gross. But what actually happens to a human if we smoke flour that has been dried and then um, it's got powdery mildew in it and we, and we combust it? So the only things uh, that we've seen tied to powdery mildew in human health is, is maybe an allergenic response. Um, they're not listed as human pathogens. Um, I mean, this is the reason why we don't have them on our other tests or ones that are looking for human pathogens like E. coli, Seminella, and Aspergillus. You know, Aspergillus, there have been cases of people inhaling those spores and they can get Aspergillosis. Um, and this is uh, one patient in Toronto had this happen to them maybe last year. It was published. Um, the, the patient survived, but they got a pneumothorax, and it was a really hairy scenario. Usually, aspergillosis in immunocompromised patients has like a 50% mortality rate. So it can be very serious if you get those types of spores in your lungs. But it's important to note those aren't powdery mildew spores. And powdery mildew spores are probably our, – our bodies are probably quite – um, used to them because they're on a lot of other vegetables. Um, you know, not that we're smoking those things, but um, we're certainly ingesting lots of other uh, fruits and vegetables, and the powdery mildew seem to be quite common to, uh, amongst many of them. So I've not found any literature, and I encourage anyone to forward stuff if they can find it, that suggested that this is actually a human health concern. It's more just, I think, the cosmetics and perhaps the, it might change the, the flavor and the terpene profiles and, and uh, of course, affect the yield. But um, there isn't, I think, any evidence to be alarmed of, of powdery mildew. Wow, that's really surprising. Um, you know, the, the, the lore is that you, know, you always want to avoid PM when producing for patients. And the idea that it is just simply because of having a, you know, some sort of allergic reaction uh, just sounds a lot less serious than mold spores getting into the lungs, which is how most people normally talk about it. And, and that, that it like, you know, taking up residence there. 
Yeah, and that, that can be very serious for aspergillus, and I agree. And in those cases, and, and maybe some people don't have the eye to tell the difference between the two of them. I, I certainly don't, but um, we can tell the difference very, very um, evidently with DNA. They're they're very different. So, does most post harvest processing remove it, like ethanol, or uh, you know, using hydrocarbon extraction? Will this will this just kill the mold spores, but leave the the remaining spore material there, but but inactive? I would imagine most extraction systems would obliterate it. Um, I, and I've not, uh, there's a few folks in on the field trying to look at that question, whether the extraction systems actually destroy the spores or whether they make it through. But um, if I had to place money on it, I bet ethanol extractions would, uh, would melt most of these things away. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Um, so, you know, a lot of people have been talking about that great Jorge Cervantes video that's been going around, uh, showing him uh, uh, giving his flowers with PM a hydrogen peroxide bath. That's uh, eight ounces of H2O2 to a five-gallon bucket of water, and then he he takes the flowers that uh, and and then and then washes them, kind of submerges them and jostles them around a little bit, and then hangs them to dry. And of course, since we all try to avoid um, mold generally and water on our plants, it totally looks crazy to do that. Yeah. Um, and, and you really have to make sure that you dry them well so that it doesn't happen. But so what, what are your thoughts of that? Is that a pretty effective way to remove uh, PM from your flowers if you've got an especially high uh, ratio? Yeah. And I think we saw a lot of um, the grows here resorting to that when they, when they just opened up and had a big problem with this, they were starting to resort to some of this hydrogen peroxide treatment. I think they did notice a hit in the terpenes, however, which is probably not that surprising um, uh, with hydrogen peroxide. So some of the terpene profile may change with that treatment, but um, I, I don't know what, what, what happens with yield either. Do you, do you end up, uh, I, I would imagine with a PM infection, you're not getting uh, perhaps the you're not getting the best growth. The, the plant's busy trying to fight an infection as opposed to making uh, incredible colas. And so um, there, there may be just a, a yield issue as well. So since you mentioned it, and I know this is purely speculative because I don't think there's been any studies on this, but you suggested that um, H2O2 um, uh, would likely decrease the terpenes. Now, regardless of, of the terpene test being higher or lower, um, what scientifically do you think about hydrogen peroxide would threaten um, terpene? I think it's just oxidative. I, I imagine some mm. of the uh, the terpenes would get oxidized with uh, hydrogen peroxide treatment, um, which may change limonene and terpenaline or a few of the ones that, that, are, um, that uh, may be more susceptible to that. Good. I'm glad I asked. That's really interesting. I'm going to have to look into that more myself. All right. So then, so then the last question before we move on to uh, botrytis is prevention, right? Like, you know, the best, the best cure is to not get it in the first place. And, and we know that there's probably some amount of PM on just about every plant. And the question is, um, does, do, do you create an opportunity for the powdery mildew to take over and increase the spore counts on any particular plant? So what can we do as a preventative so that we keep those spore counts negligible? Well, this is a, a bit of a self-fulfilling plug here, but what we've been pitching is, is to, to screen for these this stuff genetically and, and use it as a mechanism to perhaps accelerate your breeding toward resistant lines. If you, if you can screen all your plants, that, that the ones that are, that are starting to build up in PM, and now they're, you're not going to – this is before you can actually see the spores. Once you can see the, the powder on it, it's too late. The, the spores are there and they're going to spread. And so by that time, you're in emergency mode um, trying to chop stuff down and, and treat things. But um, prior to that, while these things are potentially incubating and building these mycelium networks, you could be screening for the plants that are – that are susceptible to it and remove those. And then by default, the ones that are left over are more likely to have resistant genetics uh, and keep breeding those. Um, so we, we view it as an opportunity to do um, some, uh, some selective breeding based on uh, you know, plant pathogens that are, that are present that you can find via, via the DNA. Right on. And as far as, so that's how you can uh, get rid of it long term through selective breeding. And it sounds like our best solution in the short term, if you're, if you're dealing with an acute situation is uh, going to labs, you know, uh, uh, keeping a hostile environment to those spores, uh, use your labs in advance, both, you know, in the soil and foliar, but I don't actually have a good answer for how it may 
blow your spore tests though. That's a, that's something that we're going to have to change in the regulations so that we can continue to use labs for probiotic growing. Yeah, exactly. That, that is the challenge is if you go to a, a lab that's using Petri films, um, powdery mildew doesn't grow on Petri films. And so they're going to be blind to it. Um, however, trichoderma, which you might want to consider using to get rid of it, um, will grow on those films. And so it's a bit of a double edged sword there that you might, the right thing to do is probably probiotics, but you're probably going to get penalized for it if the lab is using a, uh, a culture based system to, um, to track this. Right on. Definitely something we're going to have to all be active around um, with both uh, lab technique and also how the regulations are put in place. So we're not dinging the wrong people for 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 spores that are actually healthy. I mean, I, yeah, I, I think California got this right. I think their most recent regs I've seen is very species specific on the human pathogen front. So they've got a coli and salmonella, and we have a test for that that's multiplexed in two, you know, two different wavelengths. And then there's uh, four different Aspergillus species, and we have tests for all four of those as well. Um, but there isn't anything in there like a total aerobic count or total yeast and mold. And, and thank God, because those very broad um, uh, tests, uh, they're, they're reading tea leaves. They're really not telling you what's uh, beneficial versus what's, har- versus what's harmful. That, that, that's what we used to have in uh, Washington until uh, just last month. Uh, we, we changed to more along the lines of what California is doing. So, so let's, oh, move, let, let's move on to botrytis. You know, usually this time of year, um, people will first swear about powdery mildew, and that will follow the next person in line will swear about botrytis. And it's such a drag to watch a gorgeous cola growing at the top of a plant, only to have it crumble in your hands because it's rotted from the inside Dying without you out, knowing yeah. it, you know? It just makes you cry. So, so, so what is botrytis? Botrytis. So it's it's a, another mold. In fact, this one was sequenced by the Whitehead Institute many years ago. So there's already a genome sequenced for this, and it seems to cross to different plants. So it's Botrytis cinerea, which is mostly found in on cannabis, and that's at least the a test that we've been building for is toward that um, toward that genome. And we do find it. A lot of people have handed us um, Botrytis samples. The tests are positive for it. Um, it is it's uh, it is also um, something that can get to the seeds, which is something where we don't believe can happen with powdery mildew. So oh. the, the literature, at least in, in hops, is that P. macularis is unlikely to get into the seeds. Botrytis, however, seems like it can get into the seeds, and it can also survive the winter. Uh, and so it, it's, um, it, it's perhaps a little bit of a tougher one to get rid of in that regard. So um, from a testing standpoint, we are still doing leaf punches to try and pick this up. And, and that may not, we may have to change that because it doesn't always seem to show itself up in the leaves like powdery mildew does. Um, but it is believed to be systemic. Um, this is one where um, there's really good literature around botrytis scenario getting into the vasculature of the plant. Uh, and this is why you can see it in the center of the buds, too. So when it's infected, it's, it's, uh, you know, it, it, it's inside out in, in terms of its, um, its display. So, uh, yeah, it's a little bit of a different beast and sometimes, uh, you know, probably harder to deal with in many ways. So for somebody who is uh, new to it, I mean, just about anybody who's grown a crop or two has, has seen botrytis and can I identify it because it, you know, it, it's a big old bear in the grow. It's kind of hard to miss once you know what it is. But for somebody who's relatively new to uh, working with the plants, how do you identify botrytis visually without going into a lab? Well, there's, um, you know, Jorge has great pictures of this uh, in his Cannabis Encyclopedia of, of what botrytis can look like. Um, and there's even, so, you can even sometimes see it on stems as, as like little gray spots in the stems. I've even gotten the DNA test to pick it up positive on some leaves that didn't look like they were uh, infected with any fungus. So we're still learning about, um, I, I think about how early this infects things. I think that what I've read is it also has a DPI of like 18 to 30 days. This is a days post-infection, meaning that it can stay unnoticed to the human eye for that period of time before it begins to show phenotypes that we can detect with maybe a magnifying loop or something. Um, so it's uh, – the, the, I've – had some plants test positive where I would have never thought it had, it had discolored leaves that were a little necrotic here and there. And lo and behold, there's botrytis in there starting to get foot. And I bet when some of those plants mature, um, they're going to, it's going to come out in full force. So, um, I think it, this one might be a little bit harder for people to eyeball because I do think it has a, a variety of different ways in which it can, um, it can show itself. 
Right on. Um, let's go ahead and take our second short break. And when we come back, we will continue talking about botrytis. You're listening to Shaping Fire. And my guest today is Kevin McKernan, Chief Science Officer at Medicinal Genomics. We humans are attracted to plants because they offer us relief and are a whole lot of fun. Sometimes, though, the best parts are buried inside the plant, and we need to use specialty extraction technology. When it comes to cannabis, it is extraordinarily important to extract its precious oils without changing them in the process. We want to preserve the properties of the cannabinoids, terpenes, and other constituents that all work together. Since 1994, Eden Labs has been developing extraction technology and processes to do just that. Eden Labs was founded by a cannabis-loving engineer during the early days of medical marijuana in California, and the expanded Eden team has been designing and building industry-leading solutions for cannabis extraction ever since. Eden Labs' flagship product is the newly improved high-flow CO2 extractor. As other extraction companies enter the market, it is the high flow from Eden Labs that everyone chases and tries to compare themselves with. Not only that, but the improved automation software allows data to be collected, stored, and studied. Eden Labs can outfit your whole lab. Eden's cold finger ethanol extractor creates astonishing whole plant extracts working alone or in tandem with an initial stream distilling step to isolate monoterpenes before extracting the rest of the botanical constituents. Eden offers you many options, including vacuum distillation, column distilling, stirred reactor units, and accelerated solvent recovery. When you partner with Eden Labs, your lab team is enrolled into the Eden Labs training program to boost their understanding of Eden's best practices to ensure that your outputs are exactly what you require for your application, whether it be dab oil, oil for pen cartridges, or edibles. When you work with Eden, you're not just buying the tech, you're buying dedicated customer support to help you attain your business goals too. You can hear Eden's CEO, A.C. Braddock, talk about the company's values during Shaping Fire episode 19 that was all about CO2 extraction. So many of the new companies in the market just smell opportunity, slap an extractor together, and hire a marketing company. Eden Labs has been listening to feedback from extractors and consumers for about 25 years now. They care about both you and your consumer. Partner with Eden Labs to extract astonishing cannabis oils and terpenes that you will be proud of. Go to shapingfire.com forward slash Eden to find out more. If you grow cannabis with sunshine, you can often feel limited by the seasonal cycle. You want to grow sustainably and save money, so you use as little electricity as possible. But if you haven't studied or implemented light deprivation techniques into your greenhouse, you're leaving a lot of money on the table. By incorporating light deprivation solutions into your greenhouse, you can often add two or three additional growing cycles to your year. When you pencil out the financial benefit of those additional cycles, you'll realize why commercial scale light deprivation technology is remaking the cannabis industry. What used to be done by pulling tarps over hoop houses has been scaled up over the last few years in such a way that it's become mechanized, easy, and affordable to even small scale commercial cannabis operations. Forever Flowering Greenhouses is the industry leader in light deprivation, greenhouse design and operation for the commercial cannabis industry. Their team of greenhouse experts have been in the fields of Northern California for decades, and they're now building greenhouses for commercial cannabis companies across the country. If you are new to light dep and growing in greenhouses, I encourage you to go back to Shaping Fire episode 13 with guest Eric Brandstad of Forever Flowering. I talk with Eric about the importance of intelligent greenhouse management, as well as the huge financial benefit of incorporating light depth techniques. There are so many aspects of utilizing a greenhouse that can go wrong. From temperature and airflow to light depth and workflow, Forever Flowering will help you produce crop after crop of well-cared-for flowers. They can help you retrofit your existing greenhouse with light depth and other modern systems at a level that fits your budget. If you're just starting out, Forever Flowering can help you plan and build your new greenhouse so that you get started on the right foot. The cannabis business has enough risks without trying to go it alone with your greenhouse. Contact Forever Flowering Greenhouses to partner with folks who have an indisputable reputation as knowledgeable and easy to work with. Go to shapingfire.com forward slash FFG to find out more. Welcome back. You are listening to Shaping Fire. I'm your host, Shango Lose. And our guest this week is Kevin McKernan, Chief Science Officer at Medicinal Genomics. So let's talk more about botrytis. Uh, so, you know, when people first see botrytis, 
when people are in their personal gardens, a lot of folks will just pinch off that small amount of botrytis that they see with the idea of, oh, you know, I really don't want to destroy the whole cola or this whole plant. So I'm just going to, I'm going to pinch this little bit off and I'm going to take it away from the garden and just like hope for the best. And, and, you know, in, in, in personal gardens, sometimes you can get away with this, but, but my question for you is, are we just fooling ourselves? I mean, is it all, if, if it's already a little bit on the plant, is it already everywhere and this plant is doomed? Um, how bad is it? So that's a perfect question. There was someone that this happened to you this summer on, and um, there was parts of their plant that looked like they could salvage and other ones that they broke off and you know threw it into the trash. Um, and so we went and DNA tested the stuff that was clearly just covered in, in mold and also the stuff that they thought was clean. And we, we found we found botrytis DNA in all of it. Um, so they, you know, they opted to take the clean stuff and then go extract it and, and, and see if they could uh, turn it into something uh, other than a smokable product. But um, I, I really don't know if, uh, if they had continued to grow that plant for another week or two, whether the, they would have just shown up in the other flowers or not and really sprouted there. We didn't really – that didn't happen. Once they saw it break out like this, they kind of killed the thing and started tearing apart the parts that they thought they could salvage. But we did see DNA uh, in all of it. Um, so, yeah, I, I really don't have any advice on, on, on the biocontrol of this other than what you can probably find in a lot of the other uh, recommended books about using you know, trichoderma and other types of uh, yeast to try and uh, take it down. One of the things that makes me way more suspicious of botrytis than, than powdery mildew is because it is systemic, right? I mean, you are, if, if you see a little bit of botrytis on a flower and you pinch it off, you are mechanically removing the spores from the flower. But at that point, it's already in everywhere. The, yeah, it's already inside of the plant. So, so really, you're just doing an aesthetic thing at that point. Yeah. Well, you know, there is an interesting paper I'll point people to in tomatoes where they they, they deploy hexanoic acid under the root ball of tomatoes and it primes the plant to defend itself against uh, botrytis. Um, and hexanoic acid is a very interesting compound. It's actually the first compound in cannabinoid synthesis. Um, the hexanoic acid pathway is what is, is, is arguably a pre precursor to these things. Now, obviously, tomatoes don't make that, but hexanoic acid, I think, in other plants is a signaling molecule of the immune system. Um, but it's, it's an interesting paper because they actually carbon label the hexanoic acid. They show it's not actually getting past the root zone, so it's doing some type of cellular communication with the plant to prime the immune system to fight off botrytis. Oh, man, that sounds so interesting. I I will, uh, I will not only get that paper from you, um, uh, folks will be able to look on the, the, the podcast page for this episode and, and get uh, most of the papers that you're referring to, including a link to that, that great um, Rob Clark book about oh, yeah, um, hemp diseases. Yeah. Um, so, all right. So, so let's go the opposite side, right? We're talking about a, we were just talking about pinching it off in your, in your own home grow. Let's talk about uh, an indoor commercial grow. Now, if, if you, if you find a plant that is expressing botrytis and we know it's systemic, it would sound like uh, you would want to bag that plant, cut it, and get it the hell out of your indoor um, environment, right? Yeah, I, that would be my tendency because that I, I, the, once these spores start to go, they're, they, they move and they're very, they're very resistant. <laughs> so, so you know, we talked about how powdery mildew, other than some potential allergies, that it's not really all that bad for humans, even though we all try to avoid it because it's just kind of generally gross and 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 poor aesthetics. How does it go for botrytis? I mean, I mean, certainly it tastes bad and it causes you to cough, uh, but but how does botrytis affect the human? I, I, the same thing I've read is just aller allergenic. I've not seen uh, botrytis as being a, a health hazard. And if anyone has any papers to uh, show us otherwise, we were all ears, but we have been um, searching for any evidence of that uh, and uh, have opted to not have it be in the, the human pathogen panel as a result of that. The allergy part of it is certainly plenty for me. I mean, I know that when um, when I come across some botrytis in a flower when I'm trimming, let's say you know, and I and I didn't know it was coming, right? I didn't see it, and I pick it up, and it hits something, and I and it's under the light, and all of a sudden it goes poof, right? And the spores are everywhere, and of course I'm inhaling it, and it's like, oh man, time to take a step outside and get some fresh air because that stuff's really gross. Um, I think that even though you know, it, it may not be bad for humans. It's certainly 
unpleasant to my human. <laughs> yeah, indeed. And, and these things are, are fairly ubiquitous as well in the atmosphere. And so I think it's it's really comes down to if, are, are they immunocompromised or not. Um, and in those cases, maybe the, the allergenic reaction is probably more severe of a concern than um, than what a healthy individual might have from just environmental exposure to spores. So now for for a light infection of botrytis, you know, an advanced botrytis infection on a flower, I mean, the, the poor flower just melts and there's nothing left in it. But 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 some plants, they'll get just a little bit of botrytis and folks will will um, set those aside to be processed either into a topical or. Um, you know, a, a, so, you know, maybe they'll maybe they'll micro filter it and turn it into a tincture or something. Though that would be arguably sketchy as well. But my point is, is that you know, when when you process it with ethanol or with um, you know hydrocarbons, d does it kill the spore but leave the spore plant material just like it does with powdery mildew? So I don't know the answer to that. It's a good question as to whether or not uh, you know which extraction techniques. Um, do what to the spores? Uh, you know, I, I would assume the spores are the things that are probably the hardiest and that they may survive some of the extraction techniques that are out there. Um, but I don't know. I have not seen any studies done on that. Right on. You know, one of the things that really is a drag about, um, about botrytis, um, especially uh, up here uh, in, the, in the Northwest, is that down in Oregon, where they have a very popular and financially successful uh, Riesling harvest, they actually uh, spray it um, outdoors on dessert wine grapes. They actually call yeah. it no noble rot because it makes <laughs> it makes dessert wines taste better. And, you know, then the wind blows it up here in the Northwest. It's like, you know, as if we don't have enough trouble with mold just because it's so wet up here. And then we're, you know, it's, it's, they're spraying in botrytis down in Oregon and it blows up here and suddenly we've got their noble rot, which we've got a lot of swear words for. <laughs> yes, it's true. They, uh, I guess, in the wine industry, this actually helps the flavor, so it's, it's, it's used quite often for that. You know, and I should say, I have heard of some folks who have been working in indoor grows uh, where they've been chronically exposed to high spore counts and feel as if they've gotten uh, some type of allergy or or, uh, or lung infection. Um, so, you know, I, I, I don't want to proclaim that this stuff is all uh, is all rosy for people, but uh, there can be cases, I, I imagine, where you're if you're stuffed in a in a room that doesn't have right the right ventilation you're, you're constantly working around a high spore count that's probably going to aggravate the scenario yeah i can imagine it would so um so uh, similarly to pm and i and i know that you're not big on the prevention side i mean you believe in the prevention side but it's not really the focus of your research um would you say that an approach of spraying labs uh foliarly um uh would help against botrytis in the same ways that powdery mildew I'm sorry, I didn't catch your question. If foliar sprays, whether they would help? Yeah, oh, yeah, yeah. So I think that's where a lot of this is going to go, is that once we have the genome sequence of all of the pests that, that infect cannabis, well, then it's just a question of finding the genomic Achilles heel and hitting these things with RNAi or hitting these things with other enzymes that might actually um, target the weakness that you can see in, in the genome. Uh, and these foliar sprays ideally would be from molecules that are ephemeral, that are like enzymes biodegrade over time and, and RNA molecules degrade over time. And so these types of approaches, I think, are showing a lot of promise in other in other plants. And if they can work in a rapidopsis, and if you can find an economic model for them to work in $2 a pound tomatoes, you can find an economic, uh, economic model for it to work in, in cannabis. Right on. I think that is a great approach. And and while I'm at it, I want to I want to plug the uh, the Facebook uh, group, the Probiotic Farmers Alliance. It's a huge. I love that one. Yeah, yeah. me too. They got like twenty thousand members. And if you want to learn how to uh, make labs and and you know uh, lactobacilli, lactobacilli and others that will help protect protect your plants. Um, you know, you can Google it anywhere, but but that group, um, it's moderated really well, and there's a lot of pros on on that list. So, Probiotic Farmers Alliance, uh, shout out there. <laughs> so, uh, so Kevin, I, I I know I'm catching you off guard with this this uh, this last question, but you know, you have got a lot of depth in both powdery mildew and botrytis, and you know, I as an interviewer, I can only really ask you questions on things that that I've come across and and know. You know, what have have I, what's in your head about either or both of those that I haven't asked you and, and in your head, you're all like, you're like, oh man, this would be, this would be a good thing to throw into the mix as well. But, but maybe, uh, Shango doesn't, you know, know to ask you about it. What, what am I not asking you? And I should about this. Well, I would say that, um, 
so we have we've sequenced the genome of one powdery mildew that infects cannabis, and I'm somewhat suspicious there may be a second genome out there. Only because that's what we've seen with wheat and rye. There is a, a two different or three different strains of blumeria that are powdery mildews that infect those grasses. And, uh, and the, the plants have evolved a different resistance to each one of them. So um, we're somewhat eager to, to see if there's another another powdery mildew out there that infects cannabis. Cannabis having such a global spread, it would be it surprised me if there were just one. Um, right now, we've tested uh, a lot of material from California and from the East Coast, but and a little bit in Canada. But we haven't really gotten to any international markets with the test yet to know whether the powdery mildew in, in Europe, for instance, or in uh, in Afghanistan is is the same species as what we're dealing here dealing with here. And then the other thing is um, there is a, a tremendous amount of confusion in the literature over the taxonomic class of these things. In fact, there's a great book um, from Roger T.A. Cook I would point people to on the taxonomic manual of powdery mildews. Um, and it's a huge book. And what, you'll, what will frustrate you about this book is if you look at all of these species that they're, they're categorizing in here, they all look the same <laughs> by eye, uh, which uh, can be a little bit overwhelming when you realize there's this many powdery mildews out there and they all look the same. Um, what am I actually dealing with? Um, so going forward, we're, we're looking to expand the testing menu from just botrytis um, and powdery mildew onto anything that affects cannabis. So if folks have ideas and tests that we should target, we have a long list of things we're going down uh, and making assays for from, you know, fusarium to pythium to downy mildews, you name it, everything in these books that we're reading about, we're trying to make assays for. But we always want to hear from growers as to what they're actually running into. What, what are the problems that are really causing them economic harm um, so that we can uh, make assays that detect them very very early because we think early detection is the key to finding both resistance genetics and also to just preventing growth from getting uh, knocked out. The idea that there may be a novel PM that's specific for cannabis is really an interesting idea. It's probably really like the other ones, but it's just got a small difference that is, uh, that is unique. Um, how would, um, at, at what point would nature have developed this this novel version of PM? Would it would it go all the way back to you know the land races, or is this something that probably has, has happened once we all started hybridizing them? So I'll link you guys another paper to the Blumeria paper, and there they hypothesize that this is happening during domestication of uh, of the plants. That when you domesticate them, you tend to take the plants out of a surrounding where they have a lot of other species where there might be more um, hopping going on into more of a monoculture environment. And when that happens, the, you, these obligate biotrophs tend to speciate. Um, at least that's their thinking. So, um, yeah, it could be just um, that this dates back to when mankind decided to take cannabis under its wing and along with it, its pathogens decided to evolve according to new cultural uh, or new um, agricultural practices. Yeah, that makes a lot of sense. And and yet more evidence against uh, monocropping, monoculturing, and in favor of permaculturing and companion plants, right? <laughs> yeah, right. Indeed, indeed. <laughs> right on. Well, thanks so much for being on the show, Kevin. I know your time is valuable, and I'm glad that you were willing to spend an hour with us. Excellent. Thank you. If you'd like to know more about Kevin McKernan, you can check out the Medicinal Genomics website at www.medicinalgenomics.com. You can find more episodes of the Shaping Fire podcast and subscribe to the show at shapingfire.com and on Apple iTunes, Stitcher, and Google Play. If you enjoyed the show, we'd really appreciate it if you'd leave a positive review of the podcast wherever you download. Your review will help others find the show so they can enjoy it too. On the Shaping Fire website, you can also subscribe to the weekly newsletter for insights into the latest cannabis news and product reviews. On the Shaping Fire website, you will also find transcripts of today's podcast as well. For information on me and where I'll be speaking, you can check out shangolos.com. Does your company want to reach our national audience of cannabis enthusiasts? Email hotspot at shapingfire.com to find out how. Thanks for listening to Shaping Fire. I've been your host, Shango Lose.